Hello and a very good evening to you. I'm Joe Kent. He says he will never come to terms with the death of his father. Jason Evans from Oxford was just four years old when his dad Jonathan died, one of the thousands of victims in the infected blood scandal. Today, Jason and other families in the South watched as the last day of public hearings came to an end. All of our clients are passionate, unrelenting and angry, but this is a righteous anger, sir. This is the righteous anger of the ignored, the, side the sidelined and the discriminated. We don't apologise for our clients' visceral anger. We don't apologise for their desire for truth and for proper compensation for the damage done to them. Instead, let me be pinpoint clear, they are right to be angry and they are right to demand compensation, right to demand change and right to demand restitution. It's hard to comprehend the level of the tragedy. More than 1,200 people with haemophilia and other bleeding disorders contracted HIV after being given a protein made from blood plasma known as Factor VIII in the 70s and 80s. Half of them have since died. Another 30,000 patients probably contracted a different virus, hepatitis C, through the same contaminated treatment or from blood transfusions. Several thousand of them also died. And among the list of fatalities were 72 children, all haemophiliacs, treated at Trelleors College in Hampshire. Well, Jason Evans's father was infected with HIV at the Oxford Haemophilia Centre and died. Jason set up the campaign group Factor 8 looking for answers. Now, at the end of the hearings, he spoke to our reporter, Angela Walker. Something that I think about all the time is that the majority of people infected with hepatitis C and HIV are dead. Jason Evans' dad died in 1993 when Jason was four years old. Jonathan Evans had been given a new blood clotting agent called Factor VIII by doctors at the Oxford Haemophilia Centre, but the product made using imported blood was contaminated. Official documents presented to the inquiry revealed this therapy was given as part of clinical trials. Other victims included around 100 boys with haemophilia, infected with hepatitis and HIV through blood products administered to them at Lord Mayor Trelawa's school in Hampshire. Most have since died and the survivors are suing the boarding school for allegedly failing in its duty of care. Clinical trials without consent, experimentation, especially in relation to the Lord Mayor Trelaw school, and just that whole area of people being used as research subjects to study the transmission of hepatitis through these blood products without their consent, without their knowledge, is just crazy. The inquiry was set up to examine why people were given infected blood products and whether there was a cover-up. It was completely avoidable. The pharmaceutical companies skipped safety steps for reasons of cost and that more importance was given to convenience than safety and I, I do believe ultimately that's what this scandal almost entirely comes down to. The report by the chair of the inquiry Sir Brian Lagstaff is expected later this year. It will then be down to the government to act on his recommendations. Jason's been seeking the truth about his dad's death his whole adult life. Last week he became a father himself. I really don't want this to go on for another generation in my family in terms of being immersed by it, absorbed about it. Dad's always talking about it. Where's daddy's trying to get to the truth about the blood scandal? You know, I really, really don't want that. And so I was, yeah, quite keen not to have children until the end was in sight. I'm just happy she's here and healthy and we're looking forward to that whole new chapter of life now. Jason Evans ending that report from Angela Walker. While Des Collins is a solicitor representing 1,500 victims and families, I spoke to him earlier from our central London studio and asked him how his clients are feeling now the evidence has come to an end. Clearly, after a four, four and a half year inquiry coming to an end today, they are, there's a sense of relief, there's a sense of catharsis. They've been through the whole process, and although the process 
uh, will continue to some extent as they await, for, await the report coming out. There's a sense of achievement that they have got somewhere where the, over, over that period. I mean, such a long-running public inquiry, four years. Has it delivered what your clients were hoping for? To some extent, yes. To some extent, no. They now know what happened, why it happened and how it happened. I don't think they've got any real assurance from the inquiry so far or from the government so far that it couldn't happen again. And, of course, that will be one of the concerns, is one of the concerns. What lessons are they hoping will be learned from this? They'll, they're hoping the government will learn, they're hoping the Department of Health will learn, and all the Department of Health had to do back in 1980, whatever it was, was say, look, we got the policy wrong, let's change it. Um, and I think everyone would have understood at that point, but there was a refusal to accept fault, and that refusal to accept fault affected these victims for the next 40 years. So we're expecting the report uh, back in August, September time. I know there's been an interim compensation payment for some families, but when can other victims and families expect uh, a more meaningful compensation payment? The interim compensation payment was made to a very small cohort of people last uh, October. Um, the remaining victims were very, felt very aggrieved that no payments had been made to them. There's an indication from the chair this evening as he closed the proceedings that that may well change before Easter, but we've just got to await uh, and see what he does. Des Collins, thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you.